Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy day. We are so grateful because the Lord has been faithful. It's a blessed Sabbath. Uh, we, today we are going to talk about reproductive health. We are going to talk about reproductive health. But before we get into the discussion and even into introducing ourselves, I would like to invite uh, our sister Mary Maridi to pray with us. Father, King of the Universe, Master of the Galaxies, we want to come before your presence this afternoon in this um, New Life Church to just exalt your name and bless your holy name. Thank you so much for everything. All the panelists are here. We are asking that you give us wisdom through your spirit so that whatever we are going to talk, it is going to help someone somewhere who is suffering. Thank you so much, Father, for each person who is listening to this uh, presentation. Open their ears that they may hear. Even what they will hear, they also pass on to other people. We are praying that you be with us from the beginning to the end. We are praying all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Mary. I'm going to bring you uh, the panelists and we have a big team today. It's a special day. Now I will start from my far left. He will introduce himself and then we will uh, follow that. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mercy. It's indeed a pleasure to be here at the New Life uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, without much ado, my names are uh, Barclay Onyambu. I worship at uh, a sister church, one of the sister churches of the New Life uh, churches at the Karengata Seventh-day Adventist Church and that is where I serve also as a deputy first elder. By profession I'm a medical doctor and by speciality I am an obstetrician gynecologist and I have been uh, working as such for close to 20 years now. I'm married, I have two children um, just in their late teens uh, going 19 and 17 and I really thank God for them. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much. 20 years of experience. Today we are going to get a snippet of, of those experiences. Uh, next. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm Mary Ireri. Married to Ireri, and together we have two children. Um, I worship at Cornerstone SDA Church, and uh, I'm a statistician and a maths teacher by profession. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My, name's, my name's Amiri Murethi, a professional counselor, psychological counselor by profession. Um, I worship at Oasis SDS Church. I'm a widow with uh, two grown children and a grandchild. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Amen. We will skip the gentleman and go to our sister here. Happy Sabbath. My name is uh, Lona Andrews. I'm a member of New Life SDA Church. I am married to Chief Andrew O'Call, and we are blessed uh, with one daughter, Walterine Andrews. Uh, I work at SASRA as a surveillance officer, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Welcome, Sister Lona. So uh, I will introduce myself, and then my husband uh, will also introduce himself. My name is Masi Onyancha. I am also married. I have two children, Bianca and Gad. Uh, professionally, um, a project planner and manager but uh, what I currently do is crocheting and uh, taking care of the little ones. And uh, I love uh, being a blessing in someone's life. If my experience shared will bless someone, I love to do that. I'm a member of New Life SDA Church, so feel welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Felix Onyancha, and uh, professionally, I'm a certified public accountant. Um, as she said, we have blessed with two little children, Gad and Bianca. And today I will be your moderator and I'm 
glad to be here today. May God bless. Amen. So thank you so much for, for all this knowledge that agreed to come here so that we can be a blessing to everyone else at home and even in the congregation. Uh, we are going to get to understand why we are here. What is reproductive health? I know it might be something new to uh, a lot of people, but I would like to, introduce, uh, to, to welcome our doctor to give us a definition of what reproductive health is. Thank you very much, Mercy. Um, that word itself, reproductive health, has, uh, or rather that title itself has two words in it, and that is reproductive and health. Uh, maybe I begin with the health bit of it. Uh, to give us then an understanding of what reproductive health is. You know, health is the total well-being of the individual. The total well-being of the individual. And it's not just merely the absence of disease. It is you yourself as an individual, your mind, your mental activity, your physical, your bodily activity, your social, your interactions with fellow human beings, and I do dare say, your spiritual also, operating at their optimum, at their very best. And that is what really health is. And now if you add the word reproductive health, that is all I have said in relation with the reproductive system. And the reproductive system is not merely just the physical organs that are related with reproduction. It also is your sexuality, your relation with a member of the opposite sex when it comes to expression of your sexuality. That is what reproductive health is. It's the complete well-being of your expression in uniqueness as a man or a woman in relation with a member of the opposite sex. That expression completely is what reproductive health is. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, definition. Uh, as we note that reproductive health is very broad. It covers uh, a lot of sections, but today we are going to um, concentrate on miscarriages and infant loss. Miscarriages and infant loss. And we have uh, sisters here who are going to share their experience. And I hope that from the experiences, we are going to be blessed and encouraged. And if you've gone through a miscarriage or you've had an infant loss or you are just having a tough um, uh, health uh, period, we pray that you may get encouraged. So back to the doctor again. What, what are miscarriages? Or if someone asks today, what is a miscarriage and what is infant loss? Yeah, mm, a miscarriage is any pregnancy that ends before the baby is capable of surviving separate from the mother on their own with or without assistance. And uh, therefore, miscarriage has different definitions, I would dare say, depending on in the region in which you live or you're operating. In some areas, it's, it's possible for um, you know, babies as small as, I do dare say, you know, we have records of 25 weeks and below, surviving outside the mother, being born preterm before they are due, and they survive, you know, and, and continue to live and thrive. So in those regions, you'd say that a miscarriage is any pregnancy that would terminate before 26 weeks, 25 weeks. But in our area here, we know that 28 weeks is more or less the cutoff for a capability for a baby or a fetus to survive uh, if they are born and are completely separate from the mother. So in a nutshell, a miscarriage is any pregnancy that ends or terminates uh, before they are capable of surviving uh, outside the mother, with or without support? Uh, when I had my miscarriage, uh, the doctor told me it was an incomplete abortion. Now, what is the difference between abortion and a miscarriage? Or is there not a difference? Yeah, really, this is uh, it's a matter of semantics. And um, over time, the word abortion has acquired a negative connotation. And it has acquired a correlation with an induced termination of a pregnancy. Um, 
and many of them not legal or criminal and because of the unethical angle of uh, these induced uh, terminations of pregnancy the word abortion has acquired you know that negativity to it however in medical terms an abortion is as it's used in english it's anything that terminates uh, before it's viable a pregnancy that terminates before its viability is an abortion it's a it's, it's an aborted mission the mission was to continue until the pregnancy or the baby is delivered but then it aborts along the way and sadly it aborts before uh, a viable baby is there so the terms are, are more or less interchangeable uh, but nowadays many medical practitioners would like not to use the word abortion especially when they are writing to to the lay people or uh, they are either writing in their discharge summaries or they are writing uh, in communication over uh, you know to a larger public they would like to avoid the word abortion because of that negative connotation it has but really it's the same thing an abortion is a miscarriage a miscarriage is an abortion okay, thank you so much for clarifying that now we would like also to understand what infant loss is yeah yeah um any uh, baby below one year old is considered an infant the cutoff for infancy is uh, one year old so any baby who dies below below the age of one year is considered as an infant loss there's another time i probably another term i probably want to throw in here that encompasses all these losses you know all these pregnancies and infant losses uh, that do not go beyond one year and that's the term perinatal mortality perinatal mortality or deaths that surround the period of birth whether before or after and if you've seen that term it's one of the the indicators of the health status of a society if you've seen that term used that's what it means perinatal mortality deaths that occur in a very very significant and important period I do dare say in human life and society and that is the period around about pregnancy birth and below one year of a child's life thank you so much after that detailed information I would like now to invite my husband to take over yeah so welcome and uh, I would want us to go through this discourse uh, so that we can be able to understand the effects that bring uh, that come uh, with the aspects of uh, miscarriages and also infant loss so at this point in time we are going to have uh, our panelists to basically share their experiences and how this has affected them both spiritually emotionally and also uh, socially so i'm going to call our first panelist uh, lona to actually tell us a story of how did it happen to her so that it can be able to inspire somebody out there who has no experience or who has zero experience about all this welcome lona thank you felix uh, my experience uh, just uh, two days ago, uh, this celebrity John Legend and the wife actually uh, experienced a miscarriage. But uh, the question is, is this topic relevant to me as a child of God? If you read Job 3.16, the King James Version says, Or as an hidden and timely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw the light. So what is this hidden and timely? The clear word says, um, that is Job 3.16, it says, why wasn't I still born and buried as an infant who never saw the light of day? So it means that the Bible actually recognizes this aspect of miscarriages, this aspect of infant loss, this aspect of, of stillbirth. Um, if you read uh, in the book of Genesis, Genesis, um, Genesis chapter 11, verse 28, whereby the Bible actually mentions the fact that Haran, who was the father of Lot, died before, died before the father. And uh, 
the Bible, you know, when you read Genesis chapter 5, it says, and Abraham begat so and so and so and so outlived, you know, outlived the son and, and so and so begat so and so. But when Haran died before the father, the Bible actually poses and mentions this because the Bible is actually, you know, the writers of the Bible were actually shocked by the fact that a son died before the father. Now, um, on to my experience, um, I've had what they say, three pregnancies, uh, but uh, I have, uh, I had two miscarriages and uh, one, would they say, successful delivery. Um, so the first, the first uh, pregnancy, which was a miscarriage, of course, when you are told of the news that uh, you are expectant, as a first-time mother, you know, there's the excitement, you know, there's the aspect whereby you share new, you want to share the news with your friends and families, you want to compare notes and, and so forth and henceforth, you know. And so there's that bit of excitement, the fact that uh, I am expecting or we are expecting our first child. So um, as, the days go, as the days went by, um, I realized that I was uh, uh, sporting. Now when I realized that I was sporting, I did not take keen attention to, towards it. So two weeks after, when I went for my what is called prenatal visits and the doctor was examining me, realized that uh, there was something amiss. So he did not explain to me there and then what exactly was the issue, but he referred me to go to the radiology department and do another ultrasound. So when the ultrasound was being done, the sonographer asked me, how many weeks are you supposed to be? And I told her, then to tell me whatever you're telling me does not match with what is, uh, you know, what I am seeing here. So what it means is that the heartbeat of the baby stopped at six weeks and uh, that is how the news was um, was delivered to me so that is the so afterwards of course we went visited the doctor with the news and you know we organized for a for a procedure at dnc and all that then afterwards a few months afterwards uh, the lord blessed us with the second pregnancy and uh, Immediately when I realized I was expectant, same same issue of spotting, but now this time round, I was put on medication. So it was not sort of like an easy pregnancy because most of the time I was on bed rest and such and developed complications, that is preeclampsia. Um, so because of that, I had Bell's palsy, so there's a time when my, despite the fact that I was on BP medication, my pressure was still going high and uh, the baby had stopped moving. So the doctor had to make a decision there and then that we had to deliver 32 weeks. So that meant that, you know, because the baby was not yet fully developed, you know, injections to fully develop the lungs. Uh, emergency CS and uh, the baby was in NICU for for three weeks. You can say those are some of the worst three weeks or some of the worst moments in my in my life. Uh, but God is gracious. If you see her, you will not even believe uh, that she was a preterm baby. Then uh, afterwards, um, uh, towards the end of last year, December, again. Uh, received good news that I was expectant. So uh, because, uh, I was experiencing some sort of pain on my right side and also the issue of spotting. So I went to hospital. I remember us driving to hospital. That was on 31st of December. Because 1st of, first of January, it actually found us in hospital. It was around there midnight or so, about midnight, 1 a.m. So uh, the lady says, uh, it shows you four weeks, but you know, uh, there are some cysts that are here. So she called the doctor. The doctor um, said uh, we were to do surgery, we were not so comfortable. So uh, we decided to seek for, you know, further uh, opinion. And then um, 
so I was put on medication. I was put on medication, but still the doctor whom I was seeing said that the pregnancy, at that stage, you could not say whether it was viable or not, but he said, let's give it time and monitor whether all will be well. So I remember us traveling up country and uh, I was in so much pain. I went, did another ultrasound, but the gestation, it's called the gestation period was still showing the same as it was like two weeks ago. So we just knew this one, there's nothing. So when I came back, when I saw the doctor, he said he had hoped that uh, it will be, you know, the baby will expel itself um, normally, but it did not happen. So we, sh we, were, scheduled, we were scheduled for a procedure. So I remember, it is interesting how that day, immediately when I left the hospital, I started experiencing so much pain, so much pain. So we went home. That night, I did not sleep. I was in so much pain. I was cramping. I started bleeding, heavy clots and everything. Then it sort of subsided in the morning. Then as we were going, because the procedure was in the afternoon, so we decided to go. But on our drive to the hospital, the pain was too much too, too much unbearable. So I remember just landing into Nairobi Hospital and being taken to the emergency and, you know, started cleaning and the doctor came, I was done for the procedure. And uh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, just a follow-up question is, uh, how did this experience affect you emotionally as a person? Um, emotionally, uh, I can say I, I thank God for the spiritual background that I had. I thank God for a good support system for my husband, for my immediate family members, and for my friends who are there to, to pray with us, to just, you know, some will just come and just, you know, not even say a word and just sit by there. But of course, there were some nasty experiences because I remember like after my first uh, miscarriage, there was a time when I was passing by the children's class and someone made a comment that, what are you still waiting for? You know, you should bring for us a child here in, here in this children's class. And in my head, I was just thinking, how do I respond to this person? You know, as opposed to, uh, what do they say? You know, like the early miscarriages that you had, because mine have been like in the first trimester, there's nothing to show for it. So at times, if, I've not told, if someone has not told you, you will not know that someone is actually expectant. And people cannot go around telling you or putting something on their forehead that I had a miscarriage, I had a miscarriage. And so I think at times people ought to be sensitive. I've come to realize in my short years of life that at times when a couple gets married, it is none of our business to ask the couple. So when are you giving us the firstborn? You know, immediately you get a first child, people are like, when are you giving us the second child? So there's a lot of pressure that comes about, you know, from the society. So at times you're pressurized as a woman, you go pressurize your husband, you know. But um, I think for, for me, I really kept to myself. My husband is the sanguine, I'm the introvert. So him, he had told his friends to pray. Me, I had, you know, I decided to keep to myself. I decided to lock myself in the house. And so I remember there was a time even I told him to take my phone. So he's the one who had my, you know, my phone. Because at times people really don't realize that even with that, even let me say six weeks, four weeks, it is painful. It is painful as a mother. Some of us have difficult pregnancies. Let me say maybe from the first day your mouth is so bitter you cannot eat anything. Nothing can go down your throat. Then you realize after all that struggle, there's nothing to show for it. So it is really, really heartbreaking. Really, really heartbreaking for a person. But if you have a good support system, that is the people around you, your, your spouse and your family members, then I can say it sort of makes the the journey a bit bearable, if I'm to say so. Yeah, thank you, Lona. And uh, what I get from your, <clears throat> from what you've just uh, shared with us is that uh, having a, a good support system between, you know, having your family, your spouse who is able to support you 
during this difficult time actually helps you to walk through this journey. Now, I would want to ask Dr. Onyambu to basically tell us what are the causes that come up with the uh, issues of miscarriage? How does it happen? I know it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't wake up and it just happens. There should be something that basically um, propels, propels it to come out. So how, what are these causes that actually cause miscarriages? Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, there are many, many uh, known and even more unknown causes of miscarriage. But let me just refer to the text in the Bible, if you remember the Psalm 127. And why in my experience and my, my practice, I've come to really, um, you know, as it were, empathize and sympathize with people who uh, go through miscarriages. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127, if you go to the third verse there, it tells you that children are what? A gift from God. And we have numerous examples in the Bible of deep heartache of women who had difficulty in either conceiving, uh, or I don't know whether there are any examples of miscarriage, but who are childless, let me put it that way. And I guess that we underestimate the impact of a miscarriage. I must say that I, as a younger doctor, must have grossly underestimated, and I must apologize to those to whom I did not realize what they were going through, that we underestimate the impact of a miscarriage to a woman. And as you rightly asked, Lorna, what was the effect to her spiritually uh, when, when she went through this miscarriage? Many women feel abandoned, you know, when they go through a miscarriage. Why me? Why is it happening to me? And, and what is all this? This is something that we grossly underestimate. I just wanted to comment on that because Lorna mentioned it. But that is the fact. And for those who have studied it, and I have taken time to go through the literature, the emotions and emotions that a woman or a couple goes through when they have had a miscarriage are akin to when they lose a child. So it's not something to be taken lightly. Just that's on the side. Now, coming to the causes of miscarriages, the majority of miscarriages that happen below 12 weeks of pregnancy uh, have no known cause. But those who have looked at the possible causes of these miscarriages have found that if you do the studies, the molecular studies of, of, of these products, or rather the miscarriage products, you find that many of them bear marks of abnormality, chromosomal abnormality, that there is a defect that happens at the point of fertilization whose result is a conception that is incompatible with life, that even as life begins in its element, at its primary level, that the defect is so gross that it results in an unviable pregnancy. And this pregnancy that cannot live then is expelled naturally or as a process of induction by the body. So chromosomal problems are one of them, especially those that are happening in early, early pregnancy. Other possible causes which in my experience are not as common as what I've just described, include infections. There are certain infections that are known to be correlated with uh, miscarriages. Um, in medicine, we call these, we abbreviate these as torches. They include toxoplasma, rubella. Then we had syphilis, which is less common now. And then we have some viruses, groups of viruses, we have the herpes group of viruses. We now know even HIV is contributing to that. So we have a group of infections that may be related to that. Another cause is, especially if miscarriages are occurring repeatedly, uh, one must look at the possibility of an abnormality in the anatomical structure of the womb. Maybe the womb was formed with a problem in it and Sometimes we find people having a division within the womb 
and that division may be inconsistent with the proper growth of the baby. Certain organic diseases, certain diseases that affect mankind may also contribute to miscarriages and this the doctor usually investigates if the miscarriages are repeated. Um, these include diseases such as uh, thyroid diseases. We have some diseases that uh, affect an individual whereby the individual is producing uh, an immune attack on their own self. We know these diseases, an example is lupus, uh, but there are many other diseases such as those where you mount an attack on your own self. The, own, the body mounts an attack on its own self using its own defense mechanism. And these are very, uh, nowadays they are fairly common and you may find them being a cause of, uh, of uh, miscarriages. But let me say that this, overally, the first trimester, and that is the period between uh, zero weeks and 13 weeks, the miscarriages that occur in the first trimester, most of them have an unknown cause. Uh, the miscarriages that occur in the middle trimester, and that is the period between 13 weeks and, uh, and 28 weeks, in the majority of those, there is an anatomical problem. There is a structural problem with the womb. And that problem may be right from the cervix. You may find that the cervix, which is the mouth of the womb, that is the mouth that opens into the birth canal, you may find a weakness in that mouth in that it begins to give way, way in advance of a pregnancy reaching viability or term. And that we call in medical terms cervical incompetence. And this is a common cause of miscarriages. And that cervical incompetence could come as a result of either procedure done on the cervix or just, you know, naturally somebody may be born with a weak womb. And occasionally you may find some growths within the womb itself. For example, uterine fibroids. And these compete with the growing baby for space. If they are growing, if the fibroids are growing in such a manner that they are growing in towards the cavity where the baby is supposed to grow, they are a likely cause for miscarriages. But many people or many women have fibroids that are growing not in towards the cavity, they are growing outward of the cavity and they have no issue at all, at all in terms of causes. So in a nutshell, there are many, many causes of miscarriages and it, it's important to investigate if the miscarriages are repeated to investigate and find out what could be the cause. So, uh, Dr. you would want to, you know, say that uh, whenever somebody has a miscarriage and it is uh, coming out repeatedly, it is important that they are able to um, treat that uh, or basically go to the root cause of what is uh, bringing all this to the logical conclusion. And uh, does that also, if somebody doesn't do that, does it lead to infertility at the end of it? Yeah, your last question, uh, miscarriages is kind of different from infertility. One wouldn't consider somebody who has repeat miscarriages as uh, the same as infertility because inability to conceive is what is called infertility. It's a couple-specific problem. And I want to emphasize that, that uh, infertility is a couple-specific problem. Infertility has to do with the man and the woman. Um, but miscarriages may largely have to do with the woman, but occasionally you may find that, for instance, those that have chromosomal abnormalities may involve the man. So the, the two are very distinct. To, ask the, to, to answer your question, whether miscarriages, repeat miscarriages, may lead to infertility, largely no. But in occasions they may. And let me put it this way. If one the management or the treatment of miscarriages is not done properly, then one may injure the womb, especially with this procedure called uh, DNC. It's an abbreviation for dilatation and curatide. If the physician is not judicious and does not do the cleaning up of the womb uh, carefully, they may injure the inner lining of the womb, and this will lead now to infertility, as you said. But a miscarriage, and the second, second instance where it may lead to infertility is if after or during a miscarriage an infection is present and is not adequately treated. And this may result in the long-term 
to blockage of the fallopian tubes and lead to infer infertility. But um, miscarriages are distinctly different from, from infertility. And to go to the first point that you mentioned, one shouldn't worry too much if they have just had one miscarriage. In fact, your doctor would probably not worry too much if it just happens to be one. Increasingly, I think that uh, in society now, many women have had one or two miscarriages in their lives. And for me, if an individual is pretty young and they have had one, two, or even sometimes three miscarriages, I would, I would rather go slow and wait and maybe ask them to adjust on their lifestyle before I go into all these expensive uh, investigations. Um, the threshold used to be three miscarriages before you start thoroughly. Three subsequent miscarriages, by the way, I must emphasize. It's not a miscarriage, then two normal pregnancies delivered at term, then a miscarriage. They must be subsequent, one after the other. Then one, as a physician, would get worried if that is happening. But for older women, and this is now a greater number of our men, women in society now, who are beginning their, their having children at an older age, I really lower the threshold. If by the time she's getting, uh, you know, beginning her family, she's probably 35 and she's gotten two miscarriages by that time, I really go out aggressively and try and find out whether there could be an underlying problem. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ari. I would want to bring uh, Sister Mary Mrevi at this point in time and by basically asking her the question that does miscarriage affect the, you know, parents of uh, the couple uh, that is in question or also the siblings of the, of the couple? Okay, thank you so much. Yes, miscarriage um, is trauma. It's very traumatic to the family, to the mother, to the father and to the siblings. Um, to the mother, remember, she's the one who has been carrying this um, whatever child which has not been born. So physically, she's affected. She's also affected emotionally. Um, it is so traumatizing that it needs um, that grief process just like any other death because it's traumatic. The mother may go through the grief process uh, where at first she'll be shocked, shock comes, but even as I, I, I mentioned these stages, they may not follow in order. Uh, they will be in shock, then shock comes with numbness, they, they become numb, and then there's denial. Denial is very important in the first two, two, two days, but if it goes to the third, third day, it is not good. When you hear about death or a miscarriage or a death of an infant, this, um, this denial is very important to carry you through for the first two days to three days. Denial. Because the moment you are denying, you are hoping that this child, you did not miscarry, you are going to see this child, it did not happen. So you, it, you, you carry through with that hope. But now, from the third day, we call it pathological, which is not good. Then it comes to anger. The woman will go through anger. She will ask herself, oh, um, why did this happen to me? She gets angry even to the spouse, to the children, to the people, to the significant others. And even she's angry and to God, she, she asks God, why, why? And also to other people get angry to fate. And then there's the time of bargaining for the mother. She's bargaining. I wish I did this. I, 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 I was good. I was eating good food. I would sleep. I, she starts bargaining. And then there's a time for depression. Not the normal depression which people have, but it is a very deep sadness. And then there's acceptance. But before you reach acceptance, it's a process. For the father, Fathers also go through grief. It's only that they, they express their grief differently from their mothers. Remember, they are, not, not, they, are the ones, they are not the ones who are carrying this child. So physically, it will affect the mother. But emotionally, the father is as affected so much like the, the mother. And it is because men are not able to express their grief 
like women, they keep to themselves. And many times the wife is asking, eh, hey, this man is not, is not grieving the way I'm grieving. He's not going through what I'm going through. He's going through what you're going through. It's only that. He's not able to express the feelings. And you know, for uh, us Africans, men are not, are not supposed to show their emotions openly. So many times they will hide and they feel hopeless and helpless because they are not able to, to reach to your heart the way, the way they are supposed to. For the children, they grieve. If you have younger children, they will be clingy and cranky. And the, the older ones, a bit, they will, they will be obstructive and aggressive because they, 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 they are seeing what you are going through, they know this. And for the bigger children, they may keep, may keep to themselves. They may not talk. And these are the children who need to go to counsel, for counseling, the, the older ones, because they don't, they don't express it. The, the young ones, if you explain to them in simple language, they will understand. And remember, there's a God in heaven. It, it depends on how um, you are brought God in your family. God is the head. Thank you. And uh, the other thing that I would want to ask you is... Uh, for example, if I've had a miscarriage, how do you come to grief with me? Because when we realize that if you lose a parent, uh, maybe a five-year-old child, it's easier, you know, we can carry a few things, we can buy bananas, fruits, and come and say, Pole. Mm -hmm. But now, when it is a miscarriage, how do I come and tell you, Pole? You, you, you just go, you know, many people don't know how to console people who are grieving. You just go there with whatever you have and don't talk. We usually tell people, go there, because many people break the person who is grieving with their talks. They, they, they mean well, but they don't know how, I mean, what is best for this person. And there are so many voices telling you, you are supposed to grieve like this, like that. No, no, no. Grieving is personal, and it, it is individual. And the way you grieve, the way the other person grieves is different, and all is all is right. Whatever whatever grief is right. There is nothing which is wrong. But people come with other. Hey, you should have done this. You just tell them what you need. Yeah. So it. so it's it's important because if I come and find you crying, you know, uh, somebody said that if I find you crying and you're grieving. I should cry with you, you finish first, and then ask you, why were you crying? Is that, uh, you know, a good well, way to, to also grieve? <laughs> well, there are people who are not emotional that they, 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 that they cry when somebody's crying. Others, are, they, others will cry. Like, for example, if I find her crying, I will, I will cry. It's only that now I'm a counselor. I can't cry. I have to separate issues. But other people will just cry with them, which is okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mary Mrevi, on that aspect. I would want to bring uh, Mary Ireri. Uh, she's had uh, uh, a child, and then the child dies immediately after the child was born. So that we, she can also give us a story. Uh, Mary Ireri is a wife to pastor. So we would also want to know how did you know uh, this affect her. So as she narrates her story, we would also want to understand how did it when when all this happened, what was the what was happening uh, in the background within yourself, within your inner self, what was going on? Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. Yeah, it was in 2017, the month of March, and uh, we had our pregnancy that was due. And I remember that particular day, I went to school and I had my class until four, uh, my maths class. And then on my way home, during the day, I was feeling a bit uncomfortable because even that lunchtime, I was not able to eat well, but I just thought it's just because uh, maybe during 11 tea break, I, I, I took my, my soya very well and uh, the snacks I'd carried, so I never took lunch. So when I finished my class at four, I was on my way home then I thought, uh, because we are due, let me just go check what is happening. So I, I passed by uh, a, a nearby health facility, a government facility, and I explained to the, to the, to the nurse in charge, and she tells me, Sawa, let... And uh, to my surprise, she told me, my dear, you are on labor. Actually, 
uh, the pathway is uh, five centimeter open, so you need to get ready. And I'm a bit, I'm, be, I'm a bit shocked. But then, so I'm asking her, so what next? She tells me, now you need to come out of here and get somewhere to be admitted. And I'm like, why won't you admit me yet they had a maternity? She told me, right now we are on strike, so kindly go get somewhere you can be helped. And so I was out, my husband was not near then. So I came out and after that time, I don't know, my, my mind, uh, the labor now came somehow, I don't know what happened. After I was told uh, I'm on labor, so now the labor came that I had not felt, comparing to our firstborn, because we already had our first daughter. So I, I left uh, the place feeling very confused. So the, I called my husband, uh, but uh, he was not able to pick up uh, the call. He was on, on, on he was riding. I, I went to the house, and now I had to wonder what next. And Anyway, I got to a private hospital after some time, and on arriving there, they confirmed again the case, and they admitted me, and in that moment now, I was, wait I was waiting for the baby. I waited, the baby's not coming, uh, then they decided to induce me, and on induction, still the baby's not coming, and then there was a point of alarm where now the nurses kept on um, uh, uh, trying to listen to the, the heartbeat of the baby and I could hear them say ah, we can feel it from very far but that one for me I didn't worry so much I thought they were in charge so I relaxed but then after some time now uh, the baby came I delivered normally and uh, when baby came unlike our firstborn when I got the firstborn I remember the, the doctor uh, held the baby and asked me, what kind of, what, what sex is your I told her it's a baby girl. Then from that, uh, uh, she kept the baby on my, 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 my chest and then continued the other procedure. So now this time, when the baby came, I saw the, the nurse, Stukard. Okay, I don't know how to express that in English. So the nurse uh, got a little bit shocked and then Immediately, she rushed behind and then I, I could feel her trying to resuscitate by patting or something, kind of. Then from that, the next thing was I just found myself praying loudly, something that I'd never done before. So I could tell God, God, I know you have blessed us with the baby boy and I know that he's well. And I don't know what made me think like, even if he's dead, you resurrected. So I, I, I know I have that baby. And... Um, then, to cut the long story short, uh, sooner after I was told to go clean myself, then on coming out, I found my husband had already come, he was in. And so I asked him, is all well? Then he, he walked to where the baby had been put. And uh, then I looked at him, I just asked him because now I could look at the baby, the baby is sleeping there. So I looked at my husband, I asked him, uh, I could see it's a baby boy. So I asked him, is he alive? Then my husband held my shoulder and just, he didn't talk. He just nodded the head like this. And uh, for me, actually I would not believe because comparing to the first daughter, the baby was sleeping. So I took the baby, I held him in my hands, I was looking at him because I expected if he has died, there must have been something like an injury or an accident. So I was admiring the head. I was wondering maybe the ears are not there. So I could see the ears. I touched them. There are two. The hands are there, the feet. So I was wondering how is he dead? So I, it was, uh, I think uh, the nurse saw like, I don't know what I'm thinking. So now the nurse decided now to take the baby. And from there, I remember I, uh, uh, I, we slept in the hospital and I was admitted in the room just next to where, uh, to the labor ward. And during that night, I never slept. Why? Because I was looking forward to hear that baby cry. You know, like I had faith that this baby is going to come back to me. And because I was in a maternity, I was in a ward where there were mothers, we were mixed up. There were mothers who had babies, there are those of us, those who are still expecting, and now I'm there. So me, I would look at those who are uh, 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 nursing their babies, and I'm like, mine is waiting for me because I work at that other room. And I was waiting the whole night, not until morning came, and still 
the baby was was not able to wake up and we have to leave the hospital without the baby it dawned on me when uh, when i saw my the baby pack you know the bag that i had carried to the hospital and the basin i'm carrying like i'm carrying home with nothing I, that one really hit me hard and um i thank god that yeah that was it so that's how we went home without the baby boy so sorry for your loss. And I would just want to ask you, um, when all this happened, and basically when you realized that, uh, you know, you went to the hospital, you were ready to receive a baby, and then you're going home, you're actually only carrying maybe the basin and the clothes. Um, when you got home, basically, how did you, you know, how did you tell your little girl that, you know, we went to look for baby, but uh, you know, we we are. It is what it is at the moment. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's very important. Uh, when when this happened, it was around uh, nine at night. So we stayed with my husband all all long, and he had to break the news because when we went to labor, the African mothers will always want to know and they want to pray for you. So uh, my husband had to break the news to both parents from my side and from his side. Then at around uh, Sasaba Usiku, he went home and he is the one who broke the news. He explained to our little girl, by then she was three years. Uh, he told her, because she knew we were expecting and every day she would pray for our baby. So he told her that uh, um, we've gotten a baby boy. Then the girl was so happy. Uh, when is he coming? Then he told her that we, he will not be able to be coming home with mom because he has died. And the girl could not really understand, but he tried to explain to her, you see the way you eat? The baby will not be able to eat. He has died, so we will bury him. We will bury him. And because we had gone to some burials previously, he had seen, as, uh, he had seen people bury someone below there. There was something like that in mind. So when I came home, Actually, it was just amazing. I was very afraid of her asking me about that question, but she never asked me. She actually hugged me and made me cry more because she was like, Mom, sorry, God will give us another one. Yeah. So I never broke the news per se. My husband did, and for me, it was much easier. Yeah. Great. And do you think by now that, uh, you know, there's a brother, uh, does she remember of that I know children are very able to remember these little things. Does she also remember that? And how does that, you know, uh, affect you uh, emotionally? Yeah. Uh, the little guy is able to remember because we had a photo of our baby. And uh, she was shown that this is, a this is our baby, the one who died. And his, his photo is always there. So when God blessed us the following year, 2018, June, with another baby and to my surprise, when the baby was was delivered, he was copyright the first one. He was a baby boy. The face, if I could keep the two the two photos together, you would not differentiate. So she knows that we had the one who died, and God gave us another one. So she remembers, but she knows that that one died, but we have this one. So she really remembers. All right, thank you. And uh, at this point in time, I'd also want to ask Dr. Onyambu, um, you know, when Mary was explaining the process of her going to the hospital, getting the baby, and then uh, she comes, she's asking the husband, uh, how is the baby? You know, she says that she was like, maybe there could be an accident because she realized uh, the husband was not responding. And I believe the husband was not responding because of shock uh, by himself that, you know, he was still trying to come to terms by what had happened. Um, she alluded that, you know, uh, maybe there could, be, could have been an accident. That, I, I did not uh, uh, know this uh, is what happened to Mary. I know we had a discussion yesterday, but certainly something happened.
during the period from the time you were diagnosed to be going into labor and the time you actually delivered. Because I'm sure that you are feeling your baby uh, moving when you are in school and when you got to the hospital, the nurses, if there was no heartbeat, would have actually told you that there was no heartbeat when you got into the hospital. And what you ended up with was what we call in medical terms a stillbirth. In fact, to be even more specific, it is called a fresh stillbirth. A fresh stillbirth is differentiated from what we call in medical terms a macerated stillbirth, where the baby had died a lot earlier on. You know, if the baby dies in the womb for more than eight hours, you would not have given the description that you gave today to the extent that even the picture you have looks the same as the picture of the baby that you now have of the baby boy. The difference would have been very distinct between the baby you bore at that time if the baby had died before you came to the hospital and the baby you bore. So in a nutshell, what I'm concluding is that that baby died in the process of labor and delivery. That is when that baby died for 100% sure. I'm 100%, 101% sure that that's what happened. So this is what I want to say. Um, the period of labor and delivery is absolutely critical. And I tell this to all women I take care of who are going uh, in for delivery. It is so important and it is so critical that it's imp you must have an understanding of the danger signs and when your care providers are not looking out for those danger signs. You must have an understanding of those danger signs. And if they are omitting looking out for those danger signs, then you will remind them that if in labor you have not listened to my baby's heartbeat every 15 minutes, then you are missing out something. And if you are not listening to that heartbeat uh, for more than one minute during labor, then you are not picking something. You are, you are uh, you know, missing something in the management of labor. You know the danger sign of, uh, and it's common, many women know it, that if the baby is obviously in distress, the baby may pass stool in the tummy. And if you're in labor and you're in a hospital and your care provider has not broken the bag of waters that surrounds the baby to just to see whether the baby has uh, passed stool in the womb, then it's critical that you remind them. And sometimes even just by asking a question as the baby passed stool in the womb, you remind them that this needs to be done. It's not, it should not be the case. But I have seen uh, outcomes like your unfortunate outcome, Mary, where caregivers sometimes omit to do what they're supposed to do. And this I must, truth must be told. Yeah, that sometimes it happens inevitably, but sometimes it's avoidable. And this is the language we have when we review uh, situations like yours, Mary. Was this one avoidable? Or was it not avoidable? So um, I can't comment on, on this regard, but many things can go and do go wrong during the process of labor. But a lot of effort and progress has been made towards determining that things are going wrong during labor. And employing this knowledge for any medical worker saves a lot of lives, you know, a lot of babies' lives. So, just to, to, uh, to, to say, for instance, we don't know why some babies in labor, you can have a baby with a perfect placenta, perfect cord, and very normal growth, but during the, the stress of labor, that baby does not cope. You know, that baby just doesn't cope. And signs of a baby not coping with labor is when the contractions come, for instance, the heartbeat just drops severely or may drop and remain low for a long period of time. But when the contraction is gone, the heartbeat pick, picks up. In a normal uh, labor, the heartbeat will drop when there is a contraction. That's normal, it's a reaction from the baby. 
but it should pick up immediately the contraction are gone, is gone. So these are some of the things you would monitor in labor that would help uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, losses of babies such as those. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Ari. And I would want us now to move to the third experience. And I would welcome um, Marcy to tell us you know, what happened uh, during our process uh, that led to miscarriages that she has had over time. I have had three miscarriages, and uh, they were after a, a successful uh, pregnancy. I had my firstborn, uh, our daughter. Uh, the labor was was not interesting. It's usually not interesting, of course, but I had um, a difficulty after delivery. I had a lot of uh, issues. And uh, I went into depression, so that uh, killed my excitement for having another child. But two years down the line, uh, we sat down and, and agreed that we need a second born. And uh, we, shortly after that, I got pregnant. And uh, because the first pregnancy, I had had a few scares. So in this one, the gynecologist we were seeing had proposed that immediately I got pregnant, we need to, to, to go for the prenatal uh, clinics. So immediately I noticed I was pregnant. We started attending, attending our clinics. And uh, uh, a few weeks down the line, we did our first scan. It was, it was perfect. And eight weeks down the line, uh, we decided to go for another scan, and it was also good. Now, at 10 weeks, I noticed I was spotting. Uh, I decided to, it was, it was spotting, and, and the blood was, uh, there were a few clots. So I decided to go to the nearest uh, clinic, and uh, I went, I saw a doctor. Uh, he tried to use the stethoscope, you know, listening to the heartbeat and all that, but there was nothing. I could see it in his face, though he didn't tell me, but he said, you know, for us to be sure, you need to go and have an ultrasound. So I had to go to another, another hospital a distance away, around five kilometers, to go and have my ultrasound done. So I went there, and uh, in, in a very insensitive way, the sonographer tells me that uh, they, the, sac, eh, the contents of the sac had detached, so there is nothing they can do. In short, I was having a miscarriage, but I had not uh, passed uh, uh, the fetus. So I went back to the doctor. Uh, we spoke about it. Uh, I did not want to sleep in the hospital, so he suggested um, a facility that was nearby that can do a DNC. I don't know if there's a difference between a DNC and MVA, but we went to the hospital. Uh, a procedure was done. And when we were leaving the hospital, uh, the first experience I had with um, insensitivity uh, from other, other, other members of the society is that, you know, when my husband and my friend had left the facility, so I was going in to, be, to remove the line. So I go and the nurse looks at me. I think when, when someone looks at my body size, they tend to presume I am very young. So she says, So this one hit me really hard. You know, I, I have just lost a pregnancy that I was looking forward to. But someone is here already blaming me for something I did not do. So it did not really go well, but we went home fast forward. A few months down the line, we were pregnant again. Uh, we went to the hospital early, as uh, the doctor had suggested again. So we had our prenatal um, uh, cares and all that. But uh, at this point, uh, I was put on bed rest because I had one scare, so I was put on, on bed rest. Uh, I had a shop, so I chose to, to walk there. You know, let me go and see what is, what is happening. Uh, so I go to the, to the shop. The attendant I had left to, 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 to take care of the shop when I was away uh, tells me, let me do some supplies. It was a wholesale. Let me do some supplies because you are here for a few minutes. Uh, I will come back. So I sit at the shop and then a client comes in. Uh, he wants 10 liters of cooking oil. So I choose, you know, you're told don't lift heavy, heavy things and all that. So I choose to push the, 
the 10 the jerry can the 10 liter jerry can of cooking oil and then in within minutes seconds a pool of blood was trickling down like i had a pool of blood between my legs so the client looks at me he says nothing but thankfully he had uh, the exact amount so he puts the amount on the table and then walks away now i am confused what do i do do i walk and close the shop do i go back and sit there, there was a carpet i had put where i sit because my feet are usually very cold so i'm i'm thinking within me now do i go but if i go i will certify the, the carpet so i stood there blank now at this point i was not thinking blank for almost three minutes i am not thinking uh, and then after a while i decided let me just close the shop and do 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 clean myself so i cleaned where i had uh, soiled and then i decided to go to i decided to go home i went and cleaned myself i showered i washed the clothes and then i went back to the shop <laughs> I don't know what was going on in my mind, but I was very angry because I had, I had tried to do all I could so that uh, this pregnancy is successful. So I was very angry. I called my husband and it was a by the way call, you know, sasa, poa, uko poa, eh, unajua nimekuwa na miscarriage. And that is how I broke now the news to him. To me, it had not sunk. I was angry, yes, but I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't even want to go to the hospital. So I cleaned myself, went back to the shop. Uh, this time now, I am ready to work. I worked and that is it. Uh, a, um, uh, a few weeks, I think it was two weeks down the line, my father-in-law dies and it hit me. I cried for the longest I have ever cried in my life. Now the emotions were coming back. I think as, as uh, the counselor was talking, there are stages that for me took really long. So I broke down, I cried and then mourned now my father-in-law. And then fast forward now, the pressure was from within. I now want a baby. It was not about now the people around me asking, eh? I, I really wanted a child. So we tried. My menses are not regular but for the four months that we tried they were faithfully regular so it was depressing you know every month you're you're having um, your monthly period it was the most depressing part of my life so after four months i gave up he said you know what he, he talked to me and said we we have a baby girl we we have a child already so let's thank god for for bianca and uh, if god blesses us with another one let's not put a lot of pressure uh, in in us so i i gave in i understood and i totally uh, let go my sister calls me one day very early in the morning at six you know when you stay in gong you know that that cold in gong at six and i am a stay at home mother it's like midnight so she calls me at six. Sis, Niliota, umepata mbulana. And I was like, wacha ujinga. We make, we make fun. Zambia wacha ujinga, wacha nilale. Nikiamka, tutaongea. So she calls me again at nine. I know you ulipuzilia, but I have talked to mom and we have decided we are praying for you for one week. We will be waking up at three. I just told her, what And uh, sure, they prayed. And two weeks down the line, I was puking. Two weeks down the line. So I decided, let me do a pregnancy test. And it was, it was not even, you know, the second line was not visible enough. You could see it from, from a distance. So a few days again later, I do a pregnancy test. It's becoming clearer. So we decide to go to the hospital. We do the blood test. It's confirmed I am pregnant. But now I, morning sickness, my morning sickness began at two weeks. It was so severe. It's called uh, hyperemesis gravidarum. It's so, so severe. So I could, I could puke, you know, not a pick and pack a bile and blood. So it was really severe. It was, I was getting dehydrated. Um, calcium levels were going down, you know, the muscle aches and all that. So at six weeks, we went for a scan. And then at eight weeks, when we went back again for another scan, 
uh, we noticed, I, I, at six weeks we noticed I was carrying twins. So it was really exciting. You know, you have, you have lost and then double, double blessings. So we were really excited. But now at eight weeks when we went back for another scan, I don't know why the doc doctor wanted us to do another one at uh, eight weeks. We went and we noticed that uh, one of the fetus had stopped growing at six weeks. So at this point, you know you are excited, you are getting twins. I don't know if I'm the only one who usually gets excited about twins. You've been excited. And then, uh, one is not coming. So you are expecting another. So I was confused. Do I mourn? Do I appreciate this one uh, that I, I am carrying? But um, let's say life happened. The pregnancy was tough. I also had uh, pubic symphysis dysfunction. The pelvic bone opens up in some way, so it's really painful. You can't walk, so you had to crawl at some point. You know, you can't turn in bed. He has to turn you. You know, mechoka kulalia side moja, he has to turn you. You can't make a step. So it was really tough, but uh, when it got very tough, the, he decided. He said, you know, we are at 34 weeks. The child is viable. Let's uh, have an emergency CS yes, because... I was in pain. So we had us, yes, and uh, I have my baby boy. He's one year, turning three months in three days. And we thank God for everything. And, and how would you say uh, this process or whatever you've gone through, how did it affect your spiritual life? Uh, unlike our sisters, spiritually I was affected. You know, as an Adventist, uh, the friends you have are fellow Adventists. I don't know, 95% of my friends are Adventists. They are either in New Life, uh, Karengata, Maxwell, and all that, but they are Adventists. So anytime I used to think of coming to church and getting the questions, it could be, oh, Aki Pole, Pole for the loss. Okay, that alone used to make me break down. Or uh, what are you waiting for? Those questions that my sister was talking about. For those who did not know that, <clears throat> I have had these miscarriages. So I didn't want, I isolated myself. I didn't want to come to church. So I found a church, Oasis. So that is why I used to go. Because at least there, people don't know me. So I will not have those questions. And then church hopping was also another hobby. You know, you go to Mount Olives, you go to another one, another one next Sabbath. But I didn't want to to come to familiar grounds, eh? to the church where these friends are and to answer the same questions over and over again. And then um, in the next pregnancy, I was really angry, as I had said. I was mad at myself and then mad at, mad at God. You know, the first pregnancy was not easy. I have had, yes, a successful uh, delivery. I have a, a baby. I have gone through postpartum depression. I have gone through the first miscarriage. And then this is another second miscarriage. It broke me down because this is a series of either pain or loss, pain or loss. So it's, it crushed me. I couldn't pray. But um, the, the, the people I love, the people in my life uh, could always remind me, you know, we are, we are praying for you. And um, it's, it went a long way. Great. Uh, I would want now to ask our counselor. I believe that all this process, at some point in time, you could get it affects you in one way or the other. Now, how would you be able to tell, maybe personally, or maybe as the panelists have just said, how would you be able to know that now it is the right time I need to go and see a counselor? Yeah, some, people just go. some people just go and see a counselor without. Um, much thought but there are some people who are able to self-heal because of the support mostly the social support um, when they have good care and good support they may be able to accept this loss but if it persists that's where we tell people it is good to go to a counselor so that the counselor can teach you coping skills so that you can be able to cope with life and move on there are times you feel you don't, you know, like when you are depressed, you don't feel like doing anything. You don't want to get out, you don't want to meet people, you don't want to talk to anyone, you don't want, you don't, you don't, you don't. 
So that is the time when you feel helpless. This is the time you need help. Wonderful. And uh, especially when you go through the process as a mother, you get pregnant and, you know, you're counting weeks. Uh, they miscarriage all, you know, you go to the end and then you get uh, an, uh, a baby and then dies after that. Um, I believe you, as a mother, you could have looked for clothes here and there, you know, buying unisex clothes, pink, uh, blue, whichever. Um, and you've actually, you have good stock of them. How do you, as a person, as part of the healing process, how do you decide whether to keep or to dispose such a cloth? Because I believe in one way or the other, they remind you of something. Yeah, that, is, that is a very good question. Um, mostly, when, like for her, not for a miscarriage, for her now, she had clothes. But she was still hoping to get another child. This is the time you can talk with your spouse you put those clothes somewhere where you won't get see them for some time. There are other people who will heal heal that way, but there are others who want to see those clothes every time. There are those who will even make a, a dummy and dress this dummy every day, and they hold the dummy like a child because the the, the hands sometimes ache to hold something. That is another way of grief. So we, that's why I say that. All ways of grieving are right. There's nothing wrong. And let somebody do what they want to do. There are others who will give away the clothes and say, I will buy new ones when I get pregnant. Thanks. Thank you. So as our counselor says, you know, there is no right way or wrong way to basically grieve. Any way that you feel like you want to grieve, basically, I believe it's a, it's a way of coping, it's a way of coming into terms with such a situation, and it is very important. Now, I would also now want to ask Dr. Barkley on, uh, now, you know, you've had um, a miscarriage, maybe, the, uh, I remember when you said about uh, the caregivers, all the doctors who are taking good care of you, um, sometimes accidents could happen and maybe they pierce or maybe do anything that injures your womb in one way or the other but now specifically on the aspects of miscarriages and on infant loss uh, as a person how do you then physically heal from such a situation the body is amazing and i really thank god for it i always say that if we do not have an inherent capacity to heal in all respects from social, emotional injury or even physical injury, the doctors would be worth nothing. In fact, what doctors contribute to the healing of the body, if I was to ascribe a percentage to it, would be about 1%. The rest of it, the body does. And the body is an amazing, amazing organ because it has an inherent capacity to heal and to restore itself to normal function. Physically speaking, uh, we know that by the time you are doing, let's say, four weeks after a miscarriage, the body has restored itself, especially if the miscarriage happens in the first trimester, and that is up to 13 weeks of pregnancy. The body has restored itself to normalcy. In fact, many people have conceived even before they saw their next period after a miscarriage. And that is the commoner case, that you can be able to conceive even before you see your next period. So, long time, we, we, when I was in medical school as an undergraduate, we were taught to tell mothers to wait, you know, to wait for up to six months uh, before they could try for their next baby after a miscarriage. And I remember by the time I was uh, leaving my residency program, many studies had shown that it was not necessary to wait six months, that waiting three months was actually adequate. Now, the teaching is, in fact, you don't have to wait at all and let nature take its course. If you conceive uh, a month after uh, a, a pregnancy loss, the chance of losing that pregnancy is no higher than 
the chance of losing a pregnancy after you've waited for six months or even one year. The probability of losing that pregnancy remains the same. But what I would advise mothers is that if you have had a pregnancy loss, particularly if it has happened within the first trimester, um, embark on the things that you can do. There are certain things you can do nothing about. You know, chromosomal abnormalities, chromosomal uh, uh, mistakes that happen during conception, you may have very little to do uh, to prevent those. They're just chance happenings. But you can embark on a lifestyle that restores your body to optimal function. And we know the eight elements of uh, healthy living. It has to do with what you eat, the exercise you take, the water you take, adequate exposure to sunlight, which now we are trying to supplement with vitamin D. Vitamin D is now becoming like the panacea of all ailments. You know, and then we talk about um, avoidance of things that are injurious to the body. All these sorts of stimulus that we are exposed to, the coffees and water view that we are exposed to. You know, having adequate time uh, to take in good breaths of air, adequate rest. And this is particularly important for mothers, and I emphasize this. Women have not just seasons, but they have monthly rhythms. You know, you have a monthly rhythm. And ordinarily, it's between anything going between uh, 21 to 35 days. But most of them have a 28-day cycle. And you know, if you think about it, that cycle, that 28-day cycle is made of days within it. You know, the unit of that 28-day cycle is a day. And that day itself is divided into day and night. And to maintain a regular 28-day cycle, you must maintain the unit itself. You must maintain the circadian rhythm, the daily rhythm, and that's wakefulness and sleep. So you must have proper rest. You must have proper sleep. Sleep for eight hours, preferably sleeping before 10 o'clock because it's been shown that sleep between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning is of the greatest benefit to not just your mind but also to your physical body. That is when you really get the gains of rest, you know, between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning. So I must emphasize rest for mothers who are having issues with their reproductive system. Your reproductive system operates in a cyclic manner. That's why you have these monthly periods. And maintain that cycle. And you begin to maintain that cycle by maintaining the daily rhythm. Maintain the daily rhythm by going to bed in good time and getting good rest. Most of the mothers, including my very own mother, I saw them working until 1 a.m. in the night and then going to bed and waking up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning. You really disturb your cycle that way. And finally, when all is said and done, you must trust God. You must believe in God. God is the giver of life. And God knows what is best for you. And even when we go through these valleys that Satan brings to us, when we go through these difficult times, that Satan throws at us. So long as we have the courage and the strength to hold on to God, he'll bring us through them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry. And I would want to also bring uh, Mary Brady to tell us, you know, how does one heal now emotionally? Because I believe it, it affects you and how are you able to heal emotionally? In, you can be able to summarize that in a minute, how I'm able to heal emotionally. Okay. Um. If you want one thing, you have to trust in God. As my brother has said, God at time heals. And from there, you have to accept, accept the loss. That only then will you start healing when you accept the loss. Because denial cannot prolong for a long time because it will be pathological. So you have to accept the loss. That's the, the, the other thing. Talk to parents who have, like for, for her, who has lost an infant. And for miscarriages, look for people who have gone through the same, that you walk this journey with them. They will be able to console you. And they are better, off, they are better placed to talk to you than the people who have not gone through this. Also look for a support system, the, a support system where uh, you will be sitting together. We usually, usually encourage them to start 
um, a group of, um, like for example, for us, me, a widow, we have a, a group where we are all widows. Then we share our experiences. And then as my brother has said, you have to take care of your body physically. And also as you do these physical things, uh, join sports, swimming, uh, knit, bake, uh, cycle, a bicycle, do all those things. They will, they, will, they will help you heal. And also choose purpose to eat a nutritious meal. And uh, as we, I think we are blessed, we have so many books for health, which can help you as you walk this journey. And more so, come closer, all the family members, the husband, the children, and the people who are around you, they will give you more support. And also friends, there are those genuine friends. If you talk to them, they will help you. But there are those people, okay, they may not know whether they are hurting you with words. Like the, many, they will tell you, like they will tell you, oh, you get, you have another child. That is very, it's not a good word. You have another child. Oh, it is the will of God. Oh, you, you will get another one soon. Don't worry. This is the wrong time to tell somebody it is the will of God. Just keep your mouth shut. Just be there. Just go there and keep quiet. If they want to talk, they will talk. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Um, even the fathers also uh, go through this. Uh, the, it's not that they do not um, undergo these losses because you realize that um, as a father, as a husband, um, you've lost uh, pregnancy, you've lost uh, a child. You know, the same way, I, I would say that the same way if, for example, you have a parent or you've lost any one of you, uh, close friends or close relatives. Uh, basically, the same way that you feel when you lose uh, a dad, a mother, a brother, a friend, a very dear friend, is the very same way that, you know, we actually also feel when uh, this child uh, has been, you know, this child or the pregnancy has been lost. Because can you imagine uh, if life starts at inception, uh, it means you've actually lost uh, a life. It, it, it's not something, it's not something that was lost. And we're told that those are some of the, you know, in, uh, the, the, good, the, the people we will actually meet in heaven. So I believe with those mothers who've lost uh, miscarriages, uh, infant losses, I believe when you go to heaven, I'm, I'm just imagining that God will, you know, have your, your tribe behind you that will be following you. And uh, I, I think that as a person, it, it consoles me. And uh, the, the, the hope of, you know, uh, going to meet them one day makes me feel that, you know, uh, we will be able to reach there. So I want uh, Masi to give the closing remarks as I also invite Elder Onyambu to pray after she gives the vote, vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for accepting to come and um, share your experiences. I talked to quite a number of women, very many, and uh, they were not willing to come out and speak about what they, the losses they are, they, they've gone through. So it, I know it's their way of uh, grieving. They are taking their time and privacy. Sometimes the people who are introverted, they don't want to, to share their intimate um, <clears throat> pains and struggles. We are with you in prayers. The mothers who are grieving, the fathers who are grieving, we are with you uh, in prayers. And for those who, Sister Lona and Sister Mary, who accepted to come and, and share your, your experiences, may God give you strength. I got, I got help when I listened to others. I got better when I listened to others' experiences. And um, for everyone who has participated, if you are going through a loss, if you are going through uh, challenges in your reproductive health, uh, my phone number is 0727 122810. 0727 122810. That is my phone number. Uh, 
you are invited to make a call sometimes it's good to to speak to someone and it can get hard when you don't know who that someone is that you need to speak to we also have counselors that new life uh, church has speak to me make a call we will direct you to the counselors in the church and you will have a session of counseling thank you so much and may god bless you yeah um, lona wanted to say something in 30 seconds please and then pastor will be able to pray i'll just read a verse that is from first corinthians 10 13 uh, which says also remember that you haven't had any temptation that others haven't had God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but he will provide a way of escape so you'll be able to stand up against it. So to the women who've had miscarriages and uh, have not been blessed with a baby so far, as the panelists have said, keep on trusting in God. For those who've even had uh, miscarriages and, you know, successful uh, pregnancies and still you know other miscarriages still keep on trusting in God being a Christian does not make us immune from these problems of the world and so we pray that the Lord will keep you and hold on firm to his promises yeah thank you um, uh, as, uh, as we were almost closing there's uh, the online platform that uh, people are actually uh, talking and uh, there's a question that comes and i think elder you can be able to help us uh, uh, if you can be able to talk about ectopic pregnancy i am not sure what that is but maybe you can tell us what uh, and, and, and the effects in uh, nature yeah. thank you for your question uh, the question is very broad uh, i don't know what specifically they want to know about ectopic pregnancy but let me define it and maybe just talk a little bit of what may be the possible causes of the ectopic pregnancy and then just a little bit about its treatment in just a span of three minutes one an ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that lodges outside the womb anywhere else it lodges i mean if it does not lodge within the cavity of the womb where pregnancies normally attach and grow that is an ectopic pregnancy. Common, the commonest site where ectopic pregnancies occur is in the fallopian tube, either one of the fallopian tubes. But sometimes they can also lodge on the intestines. They can lodge on the ovary. Some ectopic pregnancies lodge even on the cervix, and they grow. Depending on where they lodge, they will cause certain symptoms. The fallopian tube, as you can imagine, is very narrow. And if, an ectopic preg if a pregnancy lodges on the, in that site within the cavity of the fallopian tube, as it continues to grow, it cannot be contained within the fallopian tube. And the likely thing is that there will be a lot of pain as the ectopic pregnancy bursts or ruptures the fallopian tube. Usually there is a lot of bleeding with this. And that bleeding can be life-threatening. Therefore, one has to rush in and, and manage that. If an ectopic pregnancy lodges on the fat that surrounds the intestines, what we commonly call the omentum, sometimes they can grow really, really big. And they can grow to the size of a term pregnancy. In fact, many of those pregnancies that lodge on the intestines or on the fat that surrounds the intestines, the omentum, grow until one is expecting to go into labor, but they're not going into labor at 40 weeks, at 41 weeks, 42 weeks, and then the doctors make a decision to induce, but they induce and the labor is not coming. Because if you can imagine, if that pregnancy is not within the uterine cavity, then the contractions will not come because the baby has grown outside the womb. And there are many babies who have grown to that size outside the womb, and that's an abnormal pregnancy. The treatment of ectopic pregnancy is that you must immediately terminate that pregnancy. It must be stopped because... If the woman is lucky to come to you before she started bleeding, there is a very likely chance that she will start bleeding, whatever it, wherever it is. Even if it is grown to 32 weeks and it's stuck on the intestines or on the wall of the intestines, it must be terminated because the bleeding can be torrential and, and terrible at whatever time. Let me just add this as I close. Um, God is so gracious that he's given us two fallopian tubes. And many women 
who've had an ectopic pregnancy on one side have gone on to have very many children with the other tube to the point that they come back and say, now you cut this tube also. I've had enough children. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. You can be able now to pray for us so that we can just wrap up the session. Thank you. Let me just, uh, before I pray, echo this. Uh, these women have been very, very courageous. Lorna and uh, Mercy and uh, Mary, I think you've been very courageous. It's not an easy subject to talk about uh, the loss of a pregnancy, whether it is at whatever stage of the pregnancy. And I must thank God for you for coming forward to share this experience because I know without a shadow of a doubt that your sharing has encouraged somebody somewhere to go through what they're going Many of you who are listening to us, I know I've either gone through this or are going through this at this moment. And I must say that God is there. God will see you through this valley of darkness and he will bring you up again. And I must reach out to those women who are also trying to get babies. Many women spend a lot of their time, a lot of their money, and a lot of their effort trying to get babies. I want to say that God remembers you. There is nothing as precious to God as the pain of a woman who's looking forward to having a child. And there are numerous examples in the Bible as to the experiences of these women as they go through this pain of childlessness. Shall we pray? Precious Father in heaven, we want to thank you. We thank you indeed for the privilege of being co-laborers with you in this mission of rescuing your people. We want to thank you for the privilege that has been ours, Heavenly Father, on this podium to share our experiences regarding this difficult topic of the gifts that you promised to your people. Satan is a liar. He's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Father in heaven, we just shelter in your arms that whatever valley Satan may bring in our lives, that Lord in heaven, you may have mercy upon us. That when we go through this pain and these experiences, restore us and restore us quickly, Heavenly Father. I want to reach out to all those women who are watching us and listening to us who have lost pregnancies in one way or another. That Father in heaven, you may not only restore spiritual pain, that Heavenly Father, that you may restore them tenfold in their experience that they may have children in the future. We remember also those who are childless, that as you did to Sarah, as you did, Heavenly Father, to very many other women in the Bible, that you may remember them and you may remember mercy. I want to thank you for the words that have been spoken from this podium. We remember that we are human and occasionally, Heavenly Father, we may sleep and speak words that do not give you glory. We ask for your mercy and forgiveness. And if there be anything that has been uttered by our mouths that lifts your name up and restores your spirit in people, Father, may all glory and honor be to you because we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.